Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the P-47 Thunderbolt and the US 362nd Fighter Group. The P-47 was a fighter bomber and very much suited to a ground attack role with its eight 50 calibre machine guns and a bomb load of £2,500 or it could carry rockets. And on top of that... It could take a lot of punishment. I'm joined by Chris Buckholtz. Chris is an aviation historian with a number of books under his belt, including Thunderbolts Triumphant, the 362nd Fighter Group versus the German Wehrmacht. But before that, this podcast is made possible by listeners like yourself who enjoy the show and help me find the time to put it together by becoming patrons and committing a dollar or two each month via Patreon. And you can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. If Patreon is not your thing for whatever reason and you would like to join the gang, go to ww2podcast.com forward slash support and you'll find information on how to support the show via PayPal. In doing so, if you check the box to be added to the mailing list, I will send you links to extras when I have them. So that's www.podcast.com forward slash support. Chris, thanks for joining me. We're going to be looking at the 362nd Fighter Group, which was activated in March 1943. Um, what was to be the unit's role? How was it uh, in- envisaged to be used? Well, when the uh, when the when the group was stood up, I think they were just trying to get enough units in the uh, on the Army Air Force to have some weight against the Germans because uh, the, there really was, wasn't a structure in place. The Ninth Air Force, when it was first envisioned, was just another Air Force, and they didn't really come up with the division of labor, so to speak, between the Ninth and the Eighth until a little bit later on. Around that time, which was which was which is uh, late forty three, early forty four. The decision was made that the Ninth Air Force was going to be a primarily uh, tactical unit, supporting supporting ground troops, doing interdiction, doing a lot of the a lot of the, the dirty low level missions. So you you had the decision made uh, let's make this a primarily P forty seven Air Force as far as the tactical fighters were concerned. The B twenty six was the other key weapon for the Ninth Air Force. But when the three sixty second stood up, they they were uh, like a lot of guys who are brand new uh, Army Air Force pilots. They were looking forward to going and, and flying and, and performing these missions like they'd read about in pulp magazines as kids. Uh, you know, everybody wants to be a fighter ace. Well, you know, it's, it's not that easy to become a fighter ace when most of your missions are flown below 2,000 feet, but, uh, but that's, that's kind of the training they were up for. And, and, and a lot of their early missions were escort missions because that was the mission that was being flown at the time. Yeah. We were just, I was just talking about this uh, a few weeks ago, you know, the idea of all these flyers joining in the, first, in the Second World War, thinking they're going to be fighter aces on the back of the fighter races from the First World War, you know, the glamour of the uh, of the fighter pilot must have been a, sh- a shock to a lot of a lot of men when they actually got into it. That it it, it wasn't sort of uh, air to air dueling in that that sort of that sort of manner. We always uh, fight the last war. That's the uh, way it works. In fact, the commander of the three sixty second, the first commander, Morton McGoffin, was really much very much of that mindset. A lot of the guys complained that. Uh, in, in his uh, in his quest to find enemy aircraft, he was leading them over uh, over uh, flak emplacements and and not really planning out the ground attack missions with the enthusiasm that they would have liked. And, and McGoffin did become an ace, so uh, so he succeeded. There were only three aces in the group, and he was one of them. The mission, as it, as it rapidly evolved for them, was brand new, and uh, uh, nobody had really envisioned the close air support, close communication that developed between the ground guys and the guys in the, in the P-47s across the entire Navy Air Force. So where are they drawing personnel from? Presumably, you know, they're having to train everyone up uh, quickly. Where do they find new, new pilots? Well, the new pilots were coming out of the various programs in the United States. There was a civilian uh, aviation pilot training program for the colleges. So you had a lot, a lot of younger people who would spend a, spent one or two years part-time training before the war, even before the war started. These guys got fed into the pipeline and were eventually trained up as the uh, junior officers for these, for these groups. The cadre of people who'd been in the Army Air Force before the war became the leadership, and that's, that was really interesting. A lot of the people who were the initial leadership of the group, um, including Morton McGoffin, uh, Colonel Joe Laughlin, who ended up becoming the group leader, and several of the, of the squadron commanders of the group had been at Pearl Harbor um, or, or at Wheeler Field or Hickam Field during the Japanese attack. 
one of the uh, one of the early guys uh, who was a, 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 a captain, so a flight leader, spent much of the war in uh, or much of the early part of the war in Iceland and shared in, in the destruction of an FW two hundred. So there there had been some action. They, they 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 had been very efficient in making sure that these guys who had experience got rotated back uh, into the United States and put in charge of these these uh, these new groups. And it wasn't always to those uh, those people's liking. If you were an experienced aviator, you didn't want to be back in Groton, Connecticut, putting together a new group. You wanted to be over in you know over in New Guinea or over in over in England, uh, trying to trying to actually take the fight to the enemy. It was the right move. You had to get a lot of young people trained on some very complicated uh, equipment, flying some some fairly advanced tactics. Uh, in order to be successful and not lose them all in combat. Yeah, and cas- cascade these people back through. So they're flying um, P-47 Thunderbolts is the 362nd. Why are they not in Mustangs? You know, How do the two planes differ? Well, the Mustang is, uh, is uh, designed for long range. It's got, an, it's got, a, it's got a liquid-cooled engine, uh, the Merlin, uh, which is a, a great engine for a high-speed fighter or escort fighter. Uh, the issue with it is that if you take a hit in the coolant system and you lose the coolant, the thing seizes. So it isn't as it isn't as, as durable an aircraft. It was, it was, there's a lot of great things about Mustangs, and I would never say anything bad about them. But um, if I was if I was to be flying low, low to the ground, strafing enemy targets, I would want to be in the Thunderbolt. Uh, the Thunderbolt started out life at Republic as, believe it or not, a lightweight fighter plan. As the war got closer, and as data came back from from Europe about what air combat was like. Uh, the decision was made to to make the aircraft more capable at high altitudes with a turbo supercharger, but also increase the firepower. And the 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 P forty seven had eight fifty caliber machine guns, which is a, a stunning amount of firepower for a single engine aircraft. I did a talk at the, the Museum of Flight in in uh, Seattle not too well about a year ago, and uh, and uh, one of the one of the visitors was talking about gun camera footage of a, of a, of a Thunderbolt opening fire on a train. Which apparently was unloaded, but the the, the weight of the fifties, the eight fifties, knocked the was knocking boxcars off the tracks. This is a pretty powerful salvo to fire at uh, fire at anything. So so from for, from a ground attack point of view, it was great as far as firepower. It could also absorb a ton of uh, a ton of punishment. And uh, there are lots of stories of, of planes flying through trees and getting bent up. I've heard I heard multiple stories from veterans of, of coming back with cylinders knocked off their airplanes, or the turbo supercharger hanging out the back, and the plane getting back. To base, so so uh, the 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 funny uh, arguments I used to hear between pilots was the guys who flew P-47s arguing with the guys who flew P-38s about which one is more survivable. You know, P-38 had two engines, so you could lose one. But the P-47 could get shot to pieces and still come back. Was it liked by the pilots? Yeah, it, it was. I think you hear the classic story about Don Blakesley on the Fourth Fighter Group who went from Spitfires into P-47s and didn't like it. Somebody said to him, you know, this, this plane can outdive any aircraft in the sky. And Blakesley said, well, that's good because it can't outclimb, outturn, or outrun any of them. If you were in a sports model like a Spitfire, it didn't seem great. If you were, if you were going to be flying as airborne artillery for guys on the ground, totally different story. Uh, these guys love these airplanes because they, they would come back in amazingly shot up conditions and, and bring them back. The, the downside of that, and this is something I ran across the book quite a, writing the book quite a lot, is that you, they had such confidence in the airplane, some guys wouldn't get out of the P-47s before it was too late. They'd try to ride it back to allied lines, or they would try to uh, nurse the airplane along at low, at low altitude with no, no ability to climb and uh, end, up, end up crashing, especially in, in the winter of 44, 45 when the weather was so bad and you couldn't really see much. At, uh, at Even at low altitude, you'd, you'd run, into, run into mountains or, or, or whatever. The other thing that was stun- stunning in writing the book was how many guys jumped out of the, out of the airplanes and didn't survive because their parachutes didn't open. You know, it's, It was not a guarantee. Get out of the airplane, you still have a, have a have a pretty reasonable chance of not making it to the ground alive. Is that is that something to do with the aerodynamics of the plane doing something peculiar with the parachute, or is it just parachute failure? There, there was a lot of parachute failure. There's also there, there's also instances where just and this may be the, the the reality for any airplane falling out of control out of the sky. You can get you can, you can get into a position on the airplane where you are aerodynamically stuck to the airframe. So there's a story in the, in the book where where somebody's underneath the airplane and can't push away from the thing as it plummets down towards towards the earth and and also you know you've got a bunch of straps and you've got a bunch of handles and levers in a cockpit and uh sometimes getting out is not that easy it's often occurred to me that you watch sort of the war films and they say okay i'm i'm you know being shot i'm jumping out now and then sort of canopy comes off and the guy sort of gaily jumps out of the top and he's off and that the actual horror of the th- must think you know, it must have been when this thing sort of nose diving to the ground at 
great speed and you're trying to get out knowing you've just got seconds to to get out and it's not level and it's spinning round and it must have been very confusing it must have been horrendous to try and get out and remember to get yourself clear pull the parachute going through your um trainings it's no wonder so many of them uh failed to to escape when they've been shot one of the guys one of the guys in the in the book ed abdallah gets he got to hit and he tried to get the canopy open and it kept slamming shut on him and he finally i guess he put both feet on the on the on the an instrument panel pushed the thing back and, and flung himself out and then found himself flopping around and both his legs were broken and he landed on the ground captured and he actually lost his he lost one of his legs and his as, as a pow uh and at a reunion he was talking to one of the people on the, in the flight with him that day about about what had happened and he said uh said man i must have gotten out of the airplane and hit the tail with my legs and his his uh, friend Kent mcclear said you didn't have you didn't have a tail your tail had been completely off <laughs> your airplane airplane was spinning around like a leaf that's why the canopy wouldn't open. There was so much centrifugal force that you, you know, you're lucky you got out at all. So this, what happened was the canopy had slid <sighs> shut on his legs. It's just it's about thinking about. So they they shipped to the U.S. They're based in um, Colchester with the uh, 9th Air Force, which is uh, I think it must be Essex, Colchester. What what missions are they flying? Presumably they're flying over the Channel, France, and into Germany. Do they get that far? Uh, just on the on the frontier of Germany, they never quite got, they, they never quite had the fuel to, to make the, the, the run all the way to Germany, the P-47s. Well, the first few missions were actually led by Francis Kabreski. One of the other Army Air Force practices was to get an experienced flight leader to take these, these green groups in. You'd have your, your senior guys from your unit, if you're the new unit, fly a few missions with the experienced units, and then you'd take an experienced leader and put them with the green unit and, and break them in. So Kabreski flew, flew five or six missions with uh, the three... 362nd, but these were all escort missions. So it was picking up bombers in the right place and and making sure your rendezvous was there and so on and so forth. They gave a pretty 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 uh, solid pace for the first few months of their operations from about February on 1944. That was the that was the initial break in period. Was this was flying escort missions? Was this to strategic bombing basic missions or are they doing sort of interdiction? Yep, this was all with B-17s and B-24s. So a very different war than they ended up fighting. When, when the invasion started to approach, things started to change quite a bit, and they were, they were given targets like air, like the airfield at Abbeville, and uh, and they first tried tried to start their uh, they, they tried to try to start developing their own tactics, and one of them was to attack the bomb the, the base with a, a mixture of uh, fragmentation bombs and smoke bombs. The idea being the smoke would obscure the uh, uh, the attacking airplanes from the anti aircraft units. Of course, it also obscures the ground from the people with the actual bombs. So not the best <laughs> tactic, but. Uh, you know, it only took them one try that one to figure it out. So now they're at the sharp end and they're facing uh, German uh, with a Luftwaffe. You know, how does the Thunderbolt compare to the ME 109 or the Focke-Wulf 190? Well, the, the, the Thunderbolt is, is surprisingly agile. It's more agile than you would think if you looked at it in comparison to one of those German aircraft. It's, it's a lot bigger. It's probably about 20, 20, 25 percent bigger than those two aircraft and a lot heavier. Uh, but it's got considerably more firepower. It's got that diving ability. So if you were a pilot with a little bit of altitude and, and you found yourself in bad shape, you pointed the nose down. They just could not stay with, stay with you. The German aircraft couldn't do it. Um, by the same token, if you were if you had altitude in the P forty seven and you spotted the Germans below you, you could pr- provide a pretty good uh, pretty good surprise to them diving out of the out of the sky at them. Because of the because of the altitude the three sixty second operated at most of the time. If you look at the gun camera footage, it's all it's almost always an engagement at low altitude. Where where uh, the speed of the thunderbolt and the uh, and the uh, ability to to sort of choose the point of attack uh, makes a lot of the difference. You also have to realize that at this stage the, the German pilot quality is starting to degrade. So you had a lot of times where where pilots were not using really good evasive maneuvers. They were not using the airplanes to their their the best of their abilities on the German side. I had a couple of pilots I interviewed who, who had scored kills who said, you know, it it really wasn't the biggest thing I did in the war shooting on those two airplanes because the pilots just weren't that good anymore. So, so they they matched up they matched up reasonably evenly, but I think the big difference here is the firepower. When the when the when the when the P forty seven got on the tail of a one hundred nine or a one ninety, um, they, they they just had a, such a punch it could take such a huge toll on the airframe. You, you've seen the you've seen the the, the footage one ninety wing snapping completely off. It's a, it's a devastating devastating level of firepower. I, I would be fascinated to see if there was any research to see the German pilot survival rate between people shot down by P forty sevens versus P-51s or P-38s. That would be interesting to me. 
So, you know, if they're flying at lower altitudes and presumably the Luftwaffe is slightly more uh, on the wane at this later part of the war, does that mean they're, um, they're more susceptible to being brought down by flak than anything else? Is that their biggest enemy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Anti-aircraft guns? Absolutely. Flak was the big, the, the big danger. They were right in the envelope of the, of the small stuff, and the Germans had a lot of 20 millimeter, 37 millimeter, you know, relatively small uh, caliber Flak, in addition to the stuff that you know, the 88s and the 105 millimeter stuff. Um, so that was that was really the, their big nemesis was flak. And when you read about some of their missions, they, they you know, you, you 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 would see the guy who got you. One of the pilots, David Childs, was shot down before the Battle of the Bulge. He was shot down, and uh, he looked out to the right and he saw the, the 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 quad 20 that had got him as he went over this little rise. And his story is pretty amazing. He. He, he tried. To, he was about to try to run it, ride it out, and suddenly the plane burst into flames. It was just a jet of flame coming out of the cockpit. It burned him very badly. Uh, he got out at low altitude, and his parachute opened, swung once, and he hit the ground. And years later, he came back to the site, and uh, he realized he'd been hit over very at very low altitude. And then, as he was trying to get out of the airplane, he just cleared a little the bridge of a valley, so the the the, 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 the airspace below him opened up, and he was able to jump out and survive. If he got out faster, he would have died. But the flak was miserable, and and, the, and one of the problems here was the Germans. The, the, the flak was mobile, so as the Germans retreated, they put they brought the flak back with them. They they had more uh, more concentration of flak later in the war than they did even during the the invasion. So uh, it got it got more and more hazardous. Now I think they the, the the groups figured out ways to mitigate that. They often had a flight of flak suppressors uh, in addition to the guys with the bombs, and uh, they would use them. Whenever they could, well, they'd, they'd bring an M M two seventy six fragmentation cluster on some of the airplanes and drop that, which is a nasty little weapon with like six six sort of small bombs that uh, you dropped. It was, it was almost like a primitive cluster bomb, and that did that did a number on flat crews, but uh, it was always a problem. You kind of think on the you know on some of the you know the, the Mustangs flying at much higher heights, it must be almost. A, you, you, you're always getting away scot free when there's there's a lot of people flying a lot lower than you will be getting hammered. By uh, flak, there's a huge flak belt, isn't there, into Germany and, and things towards the end of the war. There's a tremendous amount the Germans have pumped out uh, for air defence uh, to make up for the fact of the lack of lack of uh, effective Luftwaffe. Well, it's, it's, it's funny. This is the argument people make when they or when, when they talk about the air war against Germany not being effective. And it's like, well, part of it is not just what they destroyed. It was also the fact that the Germans had to commit so much effort to anti-aircraft defence that could have been de- devoted to fighting troops on the ground. You know, every every German uh, uh, Panzer division had a had a dedicated uh, mobile flak component to it. Um, it was dangerous flying against these guys. They 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 took their uh, they took their anti aircraft very seriously, and they 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 they, you know, they made they made the Allies pay a pretty pretty steep yeah, toll. Comes, certainly comes across in the book. So we've touched upon data. What was their role? What, sorry, what was the role of the three hundred sixty second on data? They were part of data. They, they were. They uh, they. It was interesting. They, they didn't fly a ton of missions on D-Day itself. They flew one mission across the channel toward the end of the day, escorting gliders, uh, glider towing T-47s, uh, and, and dropped them off. And that was the extent of their day. They were sort of held almost almost as like a reserve uh, in case they were needed on D-Day until late in the day. On the 7th, they flew quite a lot, though. And, and um, if you read about the uh, the air war on the 7th, the Germans kind of got back on their footing and, and took a pretty good toll on not just the not just the 362nd, but a lot of groups. I wrote about the 4th Fighter Group, and they lost quite a few aircraft on the 7th of June. But uh, but the, the role quickly shifted to attacking uh, any means that the Germans had of bringing troops up, doing interdiction. The, the close air support wasn't there yet because the, the front was too fluid still. But uh, there was still a need to get get the bridges they needed to get, uh, mine some of the ferry landings uh, so the Germans couldn't cross. A real wide variety of missions. And of course, you know, anytime, they, anytime they were coming back from a mission and they had ammunition and they ran across the German target, they would shoot it up. It was uh, it was a combination of this sort of tactical attack of of, uh, of key targets with this uh, battlefield uh, armed reconnaissance. They lost a lot of aircraft uh, that part of the war. That 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 one month period, they they they, they lost a scat of planes. Uh, I can't remember what it was now, but I think in June they they lost twenty six, twenty seven aircraft and uh, and twenty or twenty or so pilots. And uh, uh, it was de- definitely the 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 roughest month of the of the war for them and they, they still they flew most of their missions from england at the time too so it was, it was a long trip over and a long trip back and uh some time over the battlefield you know, again you're flying into the teeth of teeth of german flak in a lot of cases and uh you're flying you're you're flying uh 
for the first time in earnest, earnest against a really fully alerted enemy. If they're given a mission, they fly the mission. Are they given carte blanche uh, on the return to interdict as they see fit? Yeah, the rules of engagement were a lot less stringent back then. Um, they were they were given essentially a, a free pass as long as they could identify what the target was to shoot up anything they could shoot up that was of value to the Germans. Uh, one of the guys, Kent, Kent Geyer, who was uh, kind of a, a self-admitted hothead during the war, um, <laughs> he helped out with the book. He was really, really useful for this. But uh, <laughs> he was coming back from a mission and, and uh, strafed a herd of cows. And, uh, and the guys, in the, guys in, the, in the flight are like, what are you, what are you doing, Kent? He's like, those are German cows. <laughs> Germans still control those cows. So uh, they, they had a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty broad uh, – Pretty, pretty broad mandate to attack anything they could see that was that was uh, of use to the enemy. Um, that said, they didn't really like to do it in a lot of cases. One of the things they ended up shooting at a lot uh, and hitting was horses. Most of the German army was still horse drawn uh, during World War II, so strafing a horse was was a part of you know winning the war. But uh, most of the guys in the group I talked to hated doing it. Um, I, I think part of it is because you could you can't see hitting a, a an individual soldier. Uh, from from a distance, but you can see hitting a horse, and they also felt like the horses had you know the, the horses were not willing participants. No, I imagine a fifty caliber on a horse will make a a big mess. Yeah, yeah, sadly, yeah. So that was a, a prime target in a lot of cases, but one that the guys didn't relish having having to uh, take on. Um, and and it's interesting. They, you you read about them strafing vehicles and strafing tanks, strafing all kinds of different fixed things or mechanical things. But there was a, there was a mission later in the war where they 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 uh, attacked a, a, a barracks, a troops con- troop concentration out in the open, and and some, some of the letters Homer uh, it clearly shows how how affected the pilots were by by catching people in the open. Um, actually, killing a person is different than killing a tank or killing a truck. Yeah, they sure were. The um, one of the forgotten campaigns of 1944 was the capture of Brest. The idea was if we could capture Brest, we'd have a, a working port on the northern French coast. Uh, unfortunately, the Germans retreated into the port and they uh, they sort of fortified it, and the battle basically destroyed the city. But in the process of doing that, they developed a lot of the tactics that, uh, or, they, or they perfected a lot of the tactics they would use later in terms of close air support. Um, they, they had guys on the ground with radios. They had controllers. Uh, stationed stationed at reasonable distances so they could give targets to the uh, to the guys in the air who were already airborne. And uh, that's where the practice of taking pilots and turning them into forward air controllers started too. The, the practice was much more widespread later in the war and uh, and sort of became an art form. But at Brest is where it really started because the Germans would, would, would dig in and it was sort of a street-by-street battle. And the application of some air power uh, in a particular area, area could cause a breakthrough. In fact, this is one of the situations where, toward the end of the war, the uh, the uh, Germans were were so cowed by the by the air power that was being dropped on them that uh, one of the, one of the messages from the controllers on the ground was "Stop bombing! Stop bombing! They've had enough." So that's that's pretty effective. They, and they finally started they finally started coordinating with people on the ground. If they, if they, I think the fact that they had moved to the continent by then and uh, initially were at a, at a forward air base that was so close that the Germans could drop some 88 rounds on it, forced the 362nd to be in much, much, much closer communication with uh, with ground forces than they had even expected to be, and uh, led to them having a lot more lot more of a, of a of a working relationship as the war progressed. Now, presumably when they moved to France uh, as a unit, and they're flying from bases in France, and they're now flying over France, there's a greater chance of survive, uh, surviving, a greater chance of pilots coming down and somehow finding their way back to their units. Do we get that where, uh, you know, someone, they, they presume the pilot's, well, he's missing in action, and then a few days later he, he turns up as he's somehow crossed crossed the front lines or been smuggled through by uh, by the resistance? There's uh, situations where um, people bail out, and, and, and many, in many cases they'd, they'd be hidden by French civilians until the front advanced past them, and that could be a matter of days or weeks. Um, there's a couple of cases where guys fell in with uh, with resistance units and ended up fighting with them essentially for two or three months. Other cases, the Germans would capture capture pilots, and there were so many people they were capturing that they would put them in situations where, for instance, a train with old boxcars where the guys could push the the, the uh, slats of the boxcars apart and sneak out and escape that way. So there's there, the, the, one of the things that I was I was struck by is in that period a lot of the a lot of the most exciting stories are not in the airplane. There are people on the ground trying to, trying to get away. 
listeners probably know this. In many cases, if you escaped via the resistance uh, and you got back to England, you got sent back to the United States because they didn't want you being captured again and giving away uh, any of the secrets of the resistance. And so, so you, you had a situation where, in general, if you if you could get away from the Germans and 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 get back to friendly lines, that was your ticket back to the United States. In a lot of cases, uh, there's there's one there's one pilot in in the book who who uh, survives. He's, he's helped by a French French woman who hides him, and the Americans advance past the house, and of course he goes back to his, his unit, and he was shot down about a month later and killed. So. There, there are all kinds of outcomes for these guys, regardless of uh, where they were. I think I think my favorite one in the, in the book, and this is one I actually got almost at the very last minute as the book was being delivered to the publisher, was the story of Stan Krizwicki, who got shot down in 1940, early 40, early 45, I think. Um, he came down, uh, was was trying to hide. The Germans were everywhere. There were two there were two Russian laborers that that spotted him. Uh, who were sort of forced laborers for the Germans, but the, but this time the Germans were in such disarray that these guys had figured out they could do pretty much anything they wanted, as long as it looked like they were doing something they were supposed to be doing. So they grabbed Stan. Uh, they marched alongside a German column. Uh, and then they found a, they found a barn and they hid it. They hid in the barn. And while they were hiding in the barn, the Germans took the farmyard and turned it into a repair depot for their their cars and trucks and and vehicles. So they're hiding in there. There's there's guys going in and getting hay for the horses, and they're trying to dig down in the hay. Well, you've got this repair area with all these vehicles. It becomes a magnet for P-47s. In fact, the 362nd attacked this farmyard, and Stan is hiding in the barn with these two Russian guys. And these uh, these tracers are flying. And tracers and 50 caliber rounds are flying through the barn. And Stan Stan wrote at the time about how he's like, "How can the Germans take this? This is the worst thing I can imagine. <laughs> this experience is horrible." And he's like the only guy in the in the group who ever had that first hand uh, first hand experience of what it's like to be strafed by a P forty seven. But I imagine it for, from a pilot's point of view, there's a much greater in, well, a greater incentive to try and get back to your own lines when there's not the English Channel in the way. You know, there's actually a hope of doing it. So you know, the, the, the potentially a, a psychological thing where you keep your head down and we might just get back. Uh, <laughs> how often are they flying? Uh, you know, the bomber crews famously, you know, have their tours of tours of duty of however many flights that sometimes are moving face the the number they have to fly. But for these uh, fighter guys, fighter pilots, you know, how many? How many? How many? How do they work out how often they fly? Do they fly? You know, every few days, every day, three times a day? Yeah, it sort of depended on the pace of operations at the time. During the uh, Battle of the Battle of the Bulge, when the weather cleared, they're flying three or three times a day, three or, three or four times a day, you know, to the point of exhaustion. And a tour was uh, officially 150 combat hours. But if you were if you were a Mustang pilot flying from England on these long missions with B-17s B and B-24s, that that adds up pretty quick. Uh, if you were a P-47 pilot flying 45 minute hops, it was going to take you a while to run up that kind of a total. So. Early on, the plan was we'd, we'd have these guys on three days and have each, give each group a day off. As uh, as the pace quickened, it sort of that sort of fell apart. There was no there was no more designated, designated days off for guys and stuff like that. And the challenge there was not for the pilots in a lot of cases; it was for the guys who were maintaining the aircraft. Um, the Ninth Air Force was hatch, was was hop, uh, hopscotching across Europe to different bases, typically bases that had been owned by the Germans not very long ago, so they were not in great shape. And so the maintenance of all these aircraft was being done outside. And if you know anything about the weather in 1944, 45, that winter, it was brutal. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, my hat is off to the ground crews because they were doing amazing work in horrible conditions to keep these aircraft going. And there, there really was a P-47 shortage from, uh, from, from July 44, uh, almost all through the, all through the war because the, uh, the, the level of damage inflicted on these airplanes by flak was so severe that they were putting Aircraft back together that had no business of being put back together again. There are a couple of shots in the book. There's images of these aircraft that are stripped of parts. They're, they're, it looks like a Hulk. And then you look at the aircraft record, and it's like, well, this aircraft went back to a depot and got reassembled and then reissued to another unit. It's just incredible. So, so the people who put the airplanes together were uh, put them back together and kept them flying were really, you know, the, the unsung heroes as they always are. What are these frontline bases uh, like that they're flying from? My, you know, my some. My sort of feeling is they're probably uh, – bases is uh, quite a loose term when you think of a modern airfield. Yeah, it, it really varied. When they first crossed the channel, they went to uh, to uh, a, a base that was very close to the front lines, and it was, it, was, it was so close that when they first put up the mess tent, the Germans started shelling it, and they had to take the tent down. So they had to live off, off sea rations. It's a big field. 
with a, a metal mesh matting down. After that, they moved to Reims, which was great. They had a chateau, the, it was, they had an old German base there to use, uh, and that was that was quite nice. And people <laughs> said it was the the Park Avenue of quarters. Of course, as as the front moved, they ended up going to Attain, which is um, where they flew the, pretty much the remainder of the war till the very tail end, uh, which was a unprepared field, uh, pyramid tents, a lot of mud when it rained, just, just kind of a miserable place that you know, the mud got into, got into everything that you had, got into your socks and your sleeping bag and everything. Uh, you, you know, you wanted a shower, you got you filled up your helmet with uh, with warm water, and poured it over yourself. <laughs> you know, no amenities at all, no, nothing. And, um, and so, uh, so, so they, they really had a variety of, of uh, experiences as far as where they were quartered. But, uh, yeah, Attain was, was awful. The pyramid, pyramid tents were bad. You'd put, you'd put a, you'd be cold. So you'd put something in the stove to burn. You, you, the stove would, would do its thing. Embers would fly up the, uh, the little stove pipe and then drop back, back down in your tent and burn a hole in your tent. So, so you'd have to patch that. So the more, the more you burn things to keep warm in the tents, the more holes your tent had in it to be in and was colder as a result. So yeah, not exactly, not, not exactly the, uh, the eighth air force experience of, you know, of, of flying, coming back to your bed and then, and then getting a pass to London. So we've been, we've, we've mentioned the battle of bulge a couple of times. What role did they have in the battle of the bulge? Well, at first, like all air power, they had almost no role because the Germans picked a time when there was, was uh, weather that kept them from flying. When the weather lifted, they, they flew a lot of close air support against the Germans, especially as the Germans were trying to assemble to attack, to attack Bastogne. Uh, there are a lot of accounts of, of, uh, of the group uh, attacking German units from the German side. When I was doing the book, uh, another, another author was doing some books about the Battle of the Bulge, and, uh, and he borrowed, borrowed my stuff on it and correlated against the th- stuff he was compiling from the German side. And it was kind of amazing that the, 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 the 14th uh, Fallschirmjäger Regiment was just – pulverized by the 362nd group uh, over and over again in all kinds of in all kinds of circumstances you know stories stories where the, the, after five, five or six attacks the the, the troops have figured out if, when we hear p-47s we just go to ground we just get in, get in a basement someplace and, and don't come up until we can't hear them anymore and one of the stories is they're hiding in the basement and this, this uh, Volks, uh, Volks, Volks jagger kind of guy whose job is to deliver panzerfausts had a little cart full of Panzerfaust, and they pulled him in the basement, and he's, he's going, well, I've got, I've got to deliver the Panzerfaust. And the, the Panzerfaust will not be there when you come up. Trust us. And sure enough, they weren't. So, so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, in a lot of instances, it was, it was, uh, what happened was the, uh, these aircraft over the front, the American reconnaissance aircraft, another, an unsung part of the war, F-6 Mustangs or even L-4 Grasshoppers or whatever would spot the Germans massing troops for an attempt to to attack Bastogne or, or the fortifications around Bastogne reported in. There'd all be already already be a flight of four or eight P forty sevens in the air. They would get vectored back to that that uh, that assembly area and attack the Germans. So they really pay, played a key role in keeping the Germans from being able to mount an effective attack on Bastogne to finally take the the uh, the target. And then and then as January progressed, January forty five progressed. The weather got better and better, and they flew more and more missions. And they culminated with the with the fight on the 22nd of, of uh, January, uh, where they caught the, the Germans trying to evacuate their armor to the east uh, as they were loading them on trains. And uh, the 362nd, along with a lot of other groups, really had a field day attacking the Germans there. So th- their role was was just keeping the Germans out of the battle. Um, and, and they also did some good work. Uh, later in that period, knocking out German fortifications as the U.S. troops were moving back into places that they had already had. So that whole coordination with the ground troops had really matured uh, by the Battle of the Bulge, and that was one of the crucial things to keep Bastogne from falling into the hands of the Germans. Were they carrying rockets at this point? One of the squadrons, uh, the 377th, had rockets. Or th- I'm sorry, the 378th had rockets. The other two squadrons did not have rockets. Interesting difference between them. The commander of the group at the time, Joe Laughlin, he, his airplane was maintained by the 379th, but he also had rockets. So you had you had 16, 17 planes out of the group that had rocket capability. How effective were they? Uh, fairly effective. One of the one of the challenges was using them in the right way and and not use not to, not exposing yourself to anti aircraft. You, if you flew parallel down the road toward the enemy and fired your rockets, you had a pretty good chance of hitting something. Of course, if you if you had an enemy convoy, you also then exposed yourself to the maximum amount of flak. So they had to, they had to attack in a, in a sort of uh, manner where they're flying diagonally to the road roadway, 
and they, and they got the hang of it. There's, there's a shot of, uh, Dasburg. They caught some German, um, uh, uh, equipment on the ground there. There's a shot taken from the ground level and there's a, there's a building, uh, a destroyed building with a perfectly round hole in it with a, with a sort of a blast mark around it. And that is clearly where one of their rockets, uh, struck, struck the building. So they got, they got pretty good at, at using, uh, the rockets. They were also pretty good at using napalm. Uh, napalm was introduced at about this time too. And that was that was brutally effective, especially in the Germans in the in the in the woods. Yeah. Now, if the figures are to be believed, I, I mean, and I've completely like a, a, a Dumbo forgot to note this down, but it is an absolutely astronomical number of vehicles and material that these planes uh, took out. How reliable are the figures? Is there room is there room for manoeuvre with those figures? Because I, I wish I'd written it down because it was it was staggering. It was in the thousands, isn't it? It's 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 crazy, yeah. It's it's uh, oh, I, I don't have it handy, but uh, no, and I don't. I, I'm just flicking through oh. the book now, and I can't find it either. I wish I'd written it down in my notes. <laughs> oh, it's on page IX. I just found it. Um, <laughs> five thousand trucks, three hundred fifty tanks, two hundred seventy-five bar- artillery pieces, forty-five barges, thirty-five hundred pieces of, of railroad stock, and six hundred locomotives. Uh, yeah, that those numbers certainly can be disputed because you've got a guy shooting at something full of adrenaline. Uh, flying over, you know, going over it at 350 miles an hour, whether or not he destroyed it or not is certainly uh, is his best guess. I think those numbers can be can be certainly be taken with a grain of salt. By the same token, like 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 Leo Baron's books have said, um, the the effects on the, of the Germans that the Germans reported themselves are are pretty shattering. The, the, num- the numbers don't really make a difference if you're if you're that one guy in a half track caught in the road with no cover by a P47. Because they're, they're they're going to um, they're going to to render your vehicle inoperable and probably kill you. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I was staggered. I was absolutely staggered by uh, those figures. So where do they end the war? They ended the war in uh, Germany. They bounced across a couple of bases in Germany proper. They, they were flying missions at this time into Czechoslovakia, and and uh, one of the last guys who to be lost in the war. Uh, in total, Virgil Kirkham was in the 362nd. He hit some trees while strafing vehicles in Germany or in Czechoslovakia uh, near Pilsen. They ended up the war in Germany, and uh, um, it, it was it's 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 the last part of the book. The last few paragraphs are about the whole effort to try to get ready to go to the Pacific. Uh, when that ends, when the war in, in the Pacific ends, um, the, there's this huge exodus. All the personnel just rush back to the United States for the most part. Uh, Colonel Joe Laughlin is left with a very small cadre of people, and the three three thirty three sixty second ends up back in the United States, led, uh, ostensibly to be converting to Mustangs, but uh, they, have, they end up with like twenty officers and one enlisted man because of the drawdown at the end of the war, and so the three thirty the three sixty second just sort of just evaporates into uh, into nothing. There's uh, this there, this group with this amazing record of of bringing the war to the enemy, break, breaching dams. They they sank the they sank a, a an incomplete French battleship. They did all these rem- remarkable things, but uh, the drawdown of the war doesn't leave any room for sentimentality about uh, your performance and the the war that's just immediately concluded. There we are, Chris. That was great. Thanks. If anyone listening would like to know more, the book is Thunderbolts Triumphant: The Three Hundred Sixty Second Fighter Group versus the Wehrmacht by Chris Buchholz. As ever, I will put a link on the website www.podcast.com that's it for this episode next time we'll be looking at uh, Richard Zorge Russia's top spy of the war who was a friend of the German ambassador in Japan Zorge even had an office in the German embassy in Tokyo it's a great story I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening <laughs>